Well, in my opinion, Charles Murphy is really one of the most unusual individuals in the oil industry. He thinks deeply, he's extraordinarily articulate, and he has a tremendous sense of personal dig dignity and personal integrity. Well, he, of course, started with a very small company and built it up. I think of Murphy Oil, and I go back to my own days when Murphy was and is still one of the most respected names in the oil business. He's kind of a statesman in his quiet way of the oil industry. He was always very generous in giving all of us more credit than we were really due. And so I think anyone that has worked for him closely uh, is certainly a better person for having done so. I've often said that there's only room for one hero per company, and we all know who our hero was. And that hero is Charles Murphy. This is a story about innovation and vision, about leadership and legacy. It's a story about a company, Murphy Oil Corporation. And it's a story about the man who built it, Charles H. Murphy. In the early 1900s, Murphy's holdings consisted of 13 country banks. Today, it has evolved into a company that spans the globe. My vision was to build a company to about what we have now. We're not worldwide, but we're in selected places around the world and to operate on an integrated basis and have all of the quality and all of the competitiveness of the very largest companies. It all began in 1907 when C.H. Murphy Sr. sold 12 of his 13 country banks and used the proceeds to buy land and timber holdings. In that era, in this region, about the only thing requiring large capital or substantial capital and managerial skill was sawmills and railroads to feed the sawmills. He knew that there was oil in this region. No one knew how much because very little had been found lacking a scientific method. And he was appalled by the lack of a scientific way of exploring for oil. After conversations with geologist Everett de Gaulier, C.H. Murphy Sr. realized that someday there would be a scientific method for finding oil. So he began buying scattered tracts of land positioning himself for future oil discoveries. That was foresight on C.H. Uh, Murphy's part, uh, and it wasn't the first time he had shown foresight, but it has set the tone and the culture from uh, this enterprise uh, ever onward. It turned out that he had two sections of timberland right in the heart of the smackover field. And that was first really important production that the Murphy Group had. It was right here in the Smackover field that the first really big oil uh, was found. And uh, we had, they had, I was this high, and the company had a well over here flowing 40,000 barrels a day. I can remember just as a little fellow being brought out here by my father, and they were flowing the oil into an earthen pit. And there were dozens, maybe hundreds, of oxen team, mule team, scrambling to get another pit built before they filled the first one up. With the discovery of Smackover, South Arkansas became, for a time, the center of the petroleum industry. And Murphy's lands were right in the middle of it. 
My father was an austere man. He was, he was not severe, mind you, but there was no nonsense about him. There's a missing generation in our family. Uh, he was 50 when I was born. In the 30s, oil was plentiful in southern Arkansas. And during this time, Charles, in the summers, received an unusual education. The teacher was his father. And the lesson plan was how to run an oil company. The classroom was the inside of a car, as he, at age 12, chauffeured his father around the countryside, looking at farms, timber, and prospective oil leases. Father asked me to drive for him. He, he was crippled, he lost a hand, always had to have a chauffeur. I was his chauffeur when I was not in school. And uh, in the enforced companionship, two hours or more in an automobile, instead of talking about the football games or uh, things of that sort, why, we would discuss uh, philosophy, political economy. Maybe the teachings of uh, Shakespeare's poetry. Charles really got a wonderful classic education in those hours that he was in the car with his father on many, many subjects. People were drilling for oil all over the region. The oil boom offered plenty of practical experience for innovative and eager young men. I was just fascinated with the whole process. And in working with these older men, some of whom were a little impatient with me for the most part, they were uh, condescendingly tolerant, but they taught me so much. I finished my schoolwork when I was 16. Now, my mother thought that was too young to go to college. So the idea was that I would work two years, then go to college with boys of my own age. Well, during that two years, though, I had fallen in love. I'd started in business with $5,000 left to me by my grandfather and had uh, a dozen or more people working for me, owed $100,000, which is the equivalent of two million <laughs> uh, uh, now. And uh, the idea of being a freshman in college and wearing a beanie cap just had no appeal. When Charles and I first married, Charles was drilling a well out at uh, Catesville. And we'd go out and we'd get up in the middle of the night and go out and they'd bring in the cores and we'd take them and smell them and taste them and oh it was really fun and when the field that well came in it was salt water it wasn't just dry it was salt water which was absolutely horrible and i thought we were destitute for the rest of our lives <laughs> The year was 1941. The world was at war. C.H. Murphy Sr. was ill, and Charles, at 21, was running the family business. In partnership with Sun Oil, he had begun exploring around Delhi, Louisiana. Soon after, however, he joined the service, leaving the company once again in the hands of his father. Just before being shipped off to the Pacific, the Delhi field was discovered. That is the thing that really launched Murphy Oil. The, the Delhi discovery was the one that enabled Murphy Oil to emerge from the pack of regional or local independent producers. When I met him, he was 32. And he was, you know, a little bit of, in the oil patch, a legend already. A uh, young, successful wildcatter. Uh, Charles took uh, a nice start and built it into a, a, a very important uh, 
Fortune 500 company. I kept thinking if I if I was in his shoes, I'd be laying on the beach at Waka Key someplace. I, I wouldn't be fooling with his oil business. <laughs> After World War II, the economy expanded rapidly. There was a great demand for oil. As America prospered, so did Murphy, an enterprise with proven rules for success. You don't explore on borrowed money. Um, uh, I said don't explore on, on even uh, equity capital. And certainly not on, on borrowed uh, capital. Murphy Oil and every other good company uh, does its wildcatting and its exploration out of income. Otherwise, you could deplete your capital. In the 50s, the company was still a regional enterprise. But it had bigger ideas, and it wanted to expand geographically. In 1952, Murphy, with H.L. Hunt, won a bid on Indian land in Montana. It resulted in another important discovery, East Poplar Field. As it turned out, this was a major oil field. And of course, the royalty income was enormous to that tribe. And uh, they were grateful, and they wanted to induct me into the tribe as a, an honorary member of the tribe. It was quite an event. And Charles got right out there with those old Indians, and we, we all got out and did a lot of dancing with him. He was a crown, made an Indian chief, and he has that huge headset that you, you all see. It is. <laughs> and he looks like an Indian when he puts it on. In the early 50s, the company was poised for another big expansion. One frontier was the Gulf of Mexico. It was clear that the oil didn't stop at the water's edge, but there was no practical method for offshore exploration. I was looking for support for this idea for an offshore drilling rig and had tried all the normal places, the people who were in the business and down here on the coast and couldn't convince anybody. They all knew more about it and why it wouldn't work. And then you get up there in El Dorado, Arkansas, and they were persuaded that I maybe knew something of what I was talking about. Is why don't you back me in building a barge that I will redesign uh, and we can start off uh, drilling wells for others and then use the profit from it to take farm outs and to find our own oil. That was done. Their first drilling barge, the Mr. Charlie, was named for C.H. Murphy Sr. This venture resulted in the world's first submersible rig capable of operating in open water. Murphy was willing to be a pioneer. With this new technology, the company could leverage itself into becoming a major player, not only in the Gulf of Mexico, but eventually throughout the oceans of the world. Murphy Oil's always been willing to take unproven and untried ideas as long as a rigorous analysis would uh, indicate that this probably would work. They had much farther vision of this thing than I did and what it could mean. Uh, and I thought if we could get this one rig built and get it working properly, that would be good enough for me. But they didn't let us stop there. The gamble paid off. Odico became the largest offshore drilling contractor in the world, with more than 40 rigs operating around the globe. The company's first important discovery in the Gulf of Mexico was Ship Shoal Block 113, a hundred million barrel oil field. A uh, hundred million is the magic number. That's a major oil field. That's important to anybody. That's a big oil field. <laughs> That's a big oil field. For a company the size of Murphy, uh, it was always willing to take part in the most complicated, technical, 
advancements. Uh, in Shell Oil Company, we had an association with the Murphy Oil Company and Charlie Murphy from almost the beginning of the offshore industry. They were pioneers in projects that uh, primarily was a size that only the very, very large companies could undertake. Murphy Oil became known worldwide as an innovative company. The strategy had worked. New expansions were accomplished at a dizzying pace in the 50s and early 60s and were financed by going public. In 1956, the company that belonged to Charles and his three sisters was transformed into a publicly owned corporation. Today, an investment in Murphy Oil has provided the original public shareholders a total return of approximately 2,600%. With this new source of capital, the company began to build an integrated system, acquiring marketing, refining, and transportation facilities to complement its exploration and production. We decided to be in, in every branch of the business. We were unique, I think, among the independent operators and wanting to be in a little bit of all of it. The 1960s represented another decade of great expansion, both in the United States and overseas. Murphy obtained exploration concessions in the Middle East, Africa, South America, and the North Sea. And it created marketing networks in Canada and Europe. We fully realized that overseas, that refining and marketing and the crude oil were equally essential, equally important, equally worthless one without the other. Why not put the cart before the horse and get a start in marketing first in Europe. And that would enable us to say to the Iranians later, you think we're small and we are, but we can market this oil. Right, look at what we have here. And of course, the Sasan field was the result of that. The Sasan field in Iran put Murphy oil on the map internationally. With Sun Oil, Atlantic Richfield, and Union of California, they discovered a billion barrel oil field. See, I spoke of 100 million being a big oil field in North America, but it has to be at least 500 million in the Middle East to be considered a big oil field, and preferably a, a billion is the turning point. And Sasan was 1.2, 1.3 billion. Of course, we lost it later. But that's all right. We got our money back many times over, had the crude oil available to our downstream system. That's the fortunes of war. The 70s were a turbulent period for the oil industry. It was an era of oil embargoes, OPEC-induced price increases, and artificial controls. There was still plenty of oil and people panicked and they'd try to fill up every time they saw a station and uh, they wanted to keep their tanks full. The earlier crisis had nothing to do with supply, closure of the Suez Canal. There was no shortage of oil. It was just that that uh, artery was closed and tankers had to go the long way around the continent of, of Africa. The natural state in oil markets is that of surplus. Times of shortage have been limited to war, the lead up to war, or the aftermath of war. It was a difficult time for the oil industry, but Murphy was able to anticipate where things were going and operate the business to its best advantage. The company grew and prospered. It was during this time that another billion barrel oil field was discovered. The Ninian Field in the North Sea. 
Ninian is one of the three or four largest of the North Sea fields. It's just east of the Shetland Islands. It's in about 500 feet of water. <laughs> there just aren't many companies this size that have participated in discovery of billion barrel fields. The early 80s were a period of record earnings. By the mid 1980s, high prices strangled demand and the price of oil plummeted from the astronomical height of $40 to $10 a barrel. But the company weathered the storm in no small measure due to a classic Murphy hallmark, financial strength. Charles's over the horizon vision, the things that got us into the North Sea and got us into the UK refining and marketing were all part of a vision that looked way over the horizon. Most people can see the horizon on a clear day, but few people can see over it. Recently, the company sharpened its business focus and capital structure by buying out the minority interest in two of its major subsidiaries and by selling the offshore contract drilling business. Sales proceeds eliminated virtually all debt. Important oil and gas reserves were acquired and refineries located in Wales, Wisconsin, and Louisiana were significantly upgraded. This company is equally proud of, uh, of its refining and marketing. Those refineries are, like our exploration techniques, are right on the leading edge of technology. Murphy Oil has demonstrated its ability to generate income consistently during various bouts with low oil and gas prices. The result is an impressive list of holdings, including exploration, production, transportation, refineries and marketing, stretching from Canada, the United States, and the Gulf of Mexico, to Ecuador, Peru, offshore Spain, the United Kingdom, Africa, the Middle East, and the Bohai Bay of China. Today, Murphy Oil is located all around the world. In Arkansas and Louisiana, it is still in the timber business, where Deltic Farm and Timber Company have close to 400,000 acres of land in farming, timber, and real estate. In our case, we started as a land and timber company, and our natural diversification and asset for the future is to just go back to where we began, further develop the, the lands. With success has come certain responsibilities and involvement in public and civic affairs. Charlie was always available to provide advice, uh, not only to Interior or to the uh, Energy Department, but to presidents. And he got to know a fair number of presidents. He was always affable. He was always ready to provide the best kind of information with regard to what the industry could do, not only in its own interest, but for the country as well. Delighted to see. What'd you do? Did you fly? Where'd you fly? A hobby? Or My respect is built on a professional respect for his career, uh, but it's also quite personal. I've been blessed by not only his friendship, but by his support. Here he is, a Democrat. Uh, I expect he might have voted for me once or twice, I don't know. Uh, but when I wanted to be on the Ways and Means Committee as a freshman member of Congress from Texas, uh, I turned to him. He was close to Wilbur Mills, another respected friend of mine. Uh, and I ended up as the sole freshman in years uh, to make the Ways and Means Committee. The company has been active in all facets of the industry. In Washington, D.C., Charles chaired the National Petroleum Council, advising government on strategic energy matters, and served on the American Petroleum Institute for 28 years. Charlie was a, and is, 
a unique combination of a person with industry knowledge and political sensitivity. So he was called on uh, by others in the industry uh, to be their emissary to other groups, particularly the environmental groups. We formed this conservation liaison committee to go find those people. And, you know, we found that they didn't have horns, and they found that we didn't have forking tails. For his work on the Conservation Liaison Committee, Charles received a citation from the National Wildlife Federation for outstanding individual service. And I want to make a present to each of you of a volume of this. Always concerned about the quality of education in this country, he served as a member of the Arkansas Board of Higher Education for 17 years and was instrumental in beginning the drive to improve public education in Arkansas. It is simple economics. With good education, people are more productive. To educate people is good business. Read them, treasure them, they're pure gold. They will enrich your lives, and who can tell? Maybe your purses as well. I wanted to really change the education system in this part of the world. Had I done it, had I succeeded in that, that would have been my greatest accomplishments in this life. But I failed. It hasn't been improved. I admire you. I wish you well. That's my greatest disappointment, conversely. Had I succeeded, that would have been my greatest success. Charles has spent a great deal of time working with private institutions, such as Hendricks College and Tulane University. Charles's efforts enabled uh, me and other members of the administration to develop a balanced budget for the first time in 25 years. That was in 1980, and we've been in the black ever since. In addition to that, Charles put the resources and intellectual force behind the Murphy Institute of Political Economy. Uh, that has become the most popular major uh, for undergraduates at Tulane. Charles is really an educator at heart more than he is a businessman. He is the best read layman I have ever met in the field of political economy. If I could give him a title, it would be that of economist or philosopher. Charles has a long-term way of thinking more so than anyone else I've ever known. He, he, he can think in decades, and I attribute that to his long study of history. After 58 years, Charles Murphy is relinquishing the reins of the company he built. Murphy Oil is under new leadership. Madison Murphy is chairman of the board, and Claiborne Deming has become the president and chief executive officer. The goal has been to develop Murphy Oil Corporation and to one of the very best in all respects of the oil companies of the world. Never could be the largest, but, but to develop it into one of the finest and its relationship with its employees, customers, respect of, of, uh, uh, of competitors, and in other words, uh, true quality. And I must boast a little, I think we've done that. I think the company has done that. I think that the main thing Charles would like to be remembered for was that he, he made a difference. I think of the 90s as the legacy. We we're handing it over to a younger generation and I know they'll do well. I hope that it is a long legacy. I hope that Murphy Oil stays there stays in Arkansas. 
It represents a kind of symbol of American initiative. It represents a symbol of the way enterprise can flourish in the United States if there is proper leadership. And that is what Charlie provided for Murphy Oil. You've got me so wound up, and I tend to become so garrulous in these things. I think I've told uh, you and whoever will see this more than they'll ever want to know about Murphy Oil.